I just want to read one verse to you out of this passage that I asked Brother Joe to read for us, and that would be the 22nd verse of Hebrews chapter 7. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better <clears throat> testament, that is a better covenant. If you are acquainted with the book of Hebrews, and most of you are, you know that uh, here's what the apostle is setting forth, that that uh, covenant of grace, that everlasting covenant, and what I'll call the gospel covenant is infinitely better than the old covenant. The old covenant consisted of this, obey and live. Disobey and die. However, the new covenant is a covenant of grace. It is a covenant, the stipulations of which concerning the salvation of sinners, those stipulations, they have fallen upon our Savior only. He only is responsible for the safekeeping and the safe bringing of all of God's children home to glory. So I want to speak to you on Jesus was made a surety. And I'll first of all answer this question just exactly what is a surety. Well, the basic meaning of surety is one who draws near to another and makes himself responsible for the safe appearing of another. It's one who pledges himself the honor of his name or his property or his very life for the safety and well-being of another. That's what a surety is according to the scriptures. Uh, years ago, my dear friend, Brother Butler, whom I miss, I certainly appreciated and learned much from his wisdom and his counsel. He and Scott Richardson were born same day, same year. Uh, they were good friends, but he told me that he spoke to a corporate uh, lawyer and that lawyer told him the difference between a guarantor and a surety. A uh, guarantor is, and I'll give you an illustration of it because this best defines guarantor. When uh, our grandson Ethan wanted to buy a car, his first vehicle, he in order to get a lower interest rate, uh, I went as his guarantor. That is, if he couldn't pay, it falls on me. I'm his guarantor. That is different from a surety. A surety isn't one who takes this approach, well, if you can't pay, I will. Here's what a surety is. A surety says, all of your debts, don't worry about them. They're mine. They're mine, totally. You see, our Lord Jesus, he wasn't a guarantor. Well, what you can't pay I'll make up the rest. That's the Armenian gospel. That's what that is. Now our Lord Jesus was not a guarantor. He was a surety. Because long before this world was ever created, back in old eternity, in God's election of grace, in the gospel covenant, God gave to the Son a people to be redeemed, to be justified, to be glorified. And our Lord Jesus, He assumed all 
all of the responsibility for the appearance of those people before the Father someday. He didn't say, what they can't pay, I'll pay. He said they are unable to pay. They have no ability to pay. I assume all the indebtedness that all of my people owe. He's our surety. Our surety. Now let me give you an illustration of this out of the Old Testament. Go back to the book of Genesis and we'll go to chapter 42. The book of Genesis chapter 42. And I won't get into this very deep here because we're going through the book of Genesis on Wednesday nights and we'll, get to, we'll have more details on this portion of Scripture in the next uh, several weeks. But just to kind of bring you up to date what this is all about. Uh, Joseph now is he's in second command over uh, Egypt and of over all the granaries of Egypt. Through God's providential dealings with him, God has brought him to a very exalted position. And he gave to Joseph understanding of the dreams that Pharaoh had had. And basically the dreams were this, there's going to be seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine. So Joseph went around and he bought up all the grain he could buy up and he stored it. And then there came seven years of famine. People were hungry nearby nations. They were hurting for food. And in order to get food, they had to go to Joseph. Well, meanwhile, back in the land of Canaan, things were okay during the seven years of plenty. But then they hit a rough patch because there were seven years of famine. And as they began to get into it, well, their supplies ran low. And so Jacob, he sends his sons, his uh, ten sons. He keeps Benjamin at home. But he sends his ten sons into Egypt to buy grain. Well, Joseph is the one that they have to appear before, and he disguised himself, and also he spoke Egyptian. So they didn't recognize him. And they told their story, how that they were Israelites and they needed to buy grain and would he sell them grain at a fair price. Well, Joseph recognized them, though they didn't recognize him. So he said to them, he said, I believe you men are spies. They said, no, we're not spies. We're, we're sons of a man by the name of Jacob back in the land of Canaan. And they said, our older brother is dead. They thought he was, but didn't know, didn't realize he was talking to him. And they said, and we have a younger brother, and he's back home with dad. And Joseph said to them, Again, remember, they don't recognize him. He says to them, if you're really on the up and up, I want you to go back and bring your younger brother, your youngest brother. I want to see him, and then I'll know that you're telling me the truth. And just to make certain you do come back, I'm going to keep one of you. And he said, I'm going to keep Simeon. And they said, okay. So they go back to the land of Canaan. And they tell dad what has happened. So let's break into the reading here in chapter 42. Chapter 42 and verse 36. And Jacob, their father, they've told him the whole story now. Chapter 42, verse 36. 
And Jacob their father said unto them, Me ye have bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, that is in his mind, Joseph was dead. Remember, these same brothers brought back the coat of many colors covered with blood. And they said, Joseph is dead. So he believes that. He says, Joseph is not in. Simeon it is not because he's locked up there in Egypt. And you will take Benjamin away? And then he said, all these things are against me. And that's a very foolish statement to make for a child of God. Just hold your place and, and go back to chapter 28 and verse 15. Chapter 28 and verse 15. He said, all these things are against me. Now that, that's a wrong conclusion. It's wrong for him to think that, and it's wrong for you who are the people of God today to think that. If God be for us, who can be against us, or what can be against us? Now look, look here in chapter 28 and verse 15. God said, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee, in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again unto this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. These things are not against you, Jacob, because God made a promise to you. And he's going to fulfill that promise. They're not working against him, they're working for him. He doesn't understand it over here in chapter 42. He can't see it here in chapter 42. But later he will realize nothing was against him. And I'll just say this to all of you who love Christ Jesus, the redeemed of the Lord. You've been begotten by the Holy Spirit. You've been born into the kingdom of God. Nothing is against you. Nothing. So well, you just don't know what I'm going through. Nothing is against you. <clears throat> because God is for you. And the God who is for you, He, he absolutely <laughs> controls everything that touches your life. That's, that's just the truth. Well, go back over here to chapter 42. So Jacob is upset. And in verse 37 now, Reuben spake unto his father. Now Reuben is the oldest. He's the firstborn. To him belongs the birthright. He is the priest of the family. And Reuben spake unto his father saying, You can kill my sons if I bring him not to thee. In other words, I'll be surety for him. Dad, I stand right here in front of you and I take an oath. I will bring Benjamin back. You let him go with me and I'll make absolutely certain that he comes back to you. And he's saying I'll be surety. He says, deliver him into my hand again, and I will bring him to thee again. But Reuben, Reuben, he, according to what Jacob says in chapter 49, he was as unstable as water. That's what the scripture says about Reuben. And the Spirit of God led Jacob to say with a definite, definite answer. He said, my son shall not go down with you. You will not be surety for Benjamin. For his brother is dead and he is left alone. 
If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. These things are against me. Notice in verse 37, notice who he puts up as collateral. He doesn't say, kill me. Kill me if I don't bring him back. He said, kill my two sons. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> huh? Thank you very much. You throwing us under the bus and you'll live. Why, he isn't qualified nor fit to be a surety. Well, time goes on. They get deeper into the famine. Look at verse 1 of 43. The famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass, when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again and buy us a little food. And Judah, Judah spake unto him, saying, the man did, he did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. Now, Joseph and Benjamin are the two sons of Rachel. Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. So actually, Benjamin is Joseph's only full brother. Okay? So Judah reminds Jacob of the situation and that they're not going to get any food. If, he, if any of them go back and they don't take Benjamin with him, they're not getting anything. So verse 4, If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. If you don't bring your youngest brother with you, you won't even be able to get into my office. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me as to tell the man whether he had yet a brother? Why did you even tell him you had a brother? And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him, according to the tenor of these words, could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? We didn't know what he was going to say. And Judah said unto Israel his father, You send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die both we and thou and also our little ones now look at verse 9 I will be surety for him I appear before you right now father and I give you my pledge I will bring him to appear before you again. You trust me with him. He said, Of my hand thou shalt require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned the second time. Hold me accountable. He didn't do like Reuben. Hey, if I don't bring him home, kill my two sons. No, Judah said, hold me accountable. I'm the one, Father, standing before you, pledging my oath to you. I will bring him home safe and sound. Surety. You can entrust his, entrust his welfare to me. Now, of course, in this, Judah is a beautiful type of our Lord Jesus. While Reuben volunteered to be his surety, 
His offer was rejected. The Spirit of God forbade Reuben from being surety for Benjamin. And then when Judah brings up the subject again, Jacob says, okay, you be surety for Benjamin. Judah, out of that tribe came our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't come out of the tribe of Reuben. He came out of the tribe of Judah. And he volunteers. Now, if he doesn't, if he doesn't bring Benjamin back, he's going to bear the blame. He said that. But you know something? Our Lord Jesus, He volunteered to be surety for all of His spiritual Benjamins. And if He doesn't bring all of those that the Father gave Him in covenant grace, if He doesn't bring them to appear before the Lord God at last, all the blame will fall on Him. But I'll tell you this. There is another who's responsible here. There's another who's going to also bear some blame. Not just Judah, but Jacob. Because Jacob enters into this with his eyes wide open and he commits the care of Benjamin to Judah. And if Judah doesn't bring Benjamin back safely from Egypt, yes, the blame is going to fall upon Judah, but it's also going to fall upon Jacob. Because Jacob was the one who said, I trust you. I trust you. And listen to me. Our Lord Jesus, He's the surety of the everlasting covenant, the gospel covenant. If He doesn't bring all of God's elect children, as I said, all of God's Benjamins, if He doesn't bring them all safely home to glory, redeemed, justified, sanctified, and glorified, our Lord Jesus will bear the blame but also the Father will because it will bring shame to the Father. After all, our Lord Jesus is said to be the elect of God. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my elect, God said. He's my elect. Who chose him to be the shirt? Did God chose him. God appointed him. And our Lord Jesus willingly and voluntarily took this responsibility upon Himself, but not without the Father's approval and not without the Father's predestinated will. Our Lord Jesus is the surety of the new covenant. He came into this world on a mission. He was commissioned by the Father. In fact, we read in Psalm 89, God said, I've laid help upon one who is mighty. See, over here in our text, go back over here at that text again. In Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Look at verse 22 again. By so much was Jesus made a surety. Well, here's the question. Who made him a surety? Who made him a surety? Well, to go back to that story over there in Genesis 42 and 43, who made Judah a surety? The father. The father, Jacob, he said no to Reuben. Yes, to Judah. Who made 
the Lord Jesus Christ to be the surety of the New Testament or the New Covenant, the Gospel Covenant, the everlasting covenant of grace. The Father did. The Father did. So in defining this word surety, it means one who draws nigh and makes himself personally responsible for the safe appearing of another. Like Judah said to Joseph later on, he says, if I don't keep Benjamin safe, I'll bear the blame forever. Our Lord Jesus will never bear the blame. He will never fail to bring all the elect home. He said, my sheep, my sheep, the Father gave them to me, they're my sheep. They hear my voice. I'll make sure they hear my voice. I'll make certain they hear the gospel message, the good news of substitution and satisfaction, the bloody death, the imputed righteousness of our Lord Jesus. He will save His people from their sins. And He shall not fail. He cannot fail. And therefore he shall bear no blame, but rather receive all the glory. And in bringing all of the elect home to glory, home to God, he glorifies the Father. And he glorifies himself. And the Spirit is glorified. And the Benjamins are saved. <laughs> the Benjamins are saved. You know who has more to say in the scriptures about suretyship than anybody else? Solomon. Look over in the book of Proverbs, chapter 6. Look at Proverbs, chapter 6. <clears throat> Look at verse 1. He says, my son, Proverbs 6 verse 1, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, in other words, and the word with can be translated for. In other words, you've shook hands in committing yourself to be the surety. And I say this reverently it, in the covenant of grace it's as though the father and the son shook hands this is the way it is in old eternity God agreed to save a savior was chosen and then a people chosen in the savior and the means of redemption was established the soul that sent it shall die to be surety for all of God's elect, you must die. And die he did. He says this, look at verse 2. If you, you've stricken hands for a stranger, well then you're snared with the words of your mouth. You know what the word snared means? Here's what it means. You're trapped. You're in this now. And our Lord Jesus, He entered into this covenant bearing full responsibility for the salvation of all those that God gave Him. And with His own words of promise, He snared Himself. He's, as it were, trapped. But it's a willing trappedness. This is something He won't get out of. He can't get out of. And He didn't want to get out of it. when he was dying upon the cross of, or when he was ready to go to the cross of Calvary to die. Peter was ready to defend him. In fact, he cut off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant, and the Lord reattached it. 
And the Lord Jesus said, put your sword up. Don't you know, if I wanted to get out of this, I'd call 10,000 angels. They'd be, here, they'd be here just immediately. But how shall the Scriptures be fulfilled? He gave His Word and the Son of God can't lie. His very name is truth. And in the covenant of grace, He pledged His own life's blood to save His Benjamins and bring them all safely home to the Father. Therefore, Solomon says in another place, Proverbs 22, 26, be thou not one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debts. In other words, you better think long and hard before you become a surety. Because you're responsible. Nobody else. Nobody else. You're legally bound to repay everything the debtor owes. Look at Proverbs 11 and verse 15. Proverbs 11 verse 15. He that is surety, Proverbs 11 15, he that is surety for a stranger, he shall smart for it. And he that hateth suretyship is sure. In other words, so I don't want to enter into suretyship. Well, you're free from all obligation then. But if you're going to be surety for a, a stranger, you're going to smart for it. So what does that mean? Ever hit your hand on something? And we used to say, and sometimes I still do, oh, that smarts. <laughs> Ever use it in that way? That's one of the meanings of the word smart. Not only means intelligent, but it's painful. Oh, that smarts when I bump against the wall or something. If our Lord Jesus, when He became surety for us, and He's always been surety, marked it down. He's going to smart for it. It's going to cost Him. Because our debt cannot be repaid to God unless he suffers and bleeds and dies. That's the wages of sin. Death. Death. He was bruised and wounded for our sins. But he knew our circumstances. He knew what the consequences of sin would be. And he became sure at the own purpose to pay all our debt which only He was capable of paying. Only He understood the infinite debt that we owed to God, and only He could pay it. Only He could satisfy God. And in the covenant of grace, His own words snared Him. He gave His word to the Father. He said over, look at John 6. Look at John chapter 6. I tell you, when our Lord, when He became sure that He took the whole of our debt, all of it, upon Himself, there wasn't any possibility we could ever pay. And you know what? God has never looked to us at any time for payment. He never has. He's always looked to our Judah. He's always looked to the Son of God. This is His responsibility. And, I, and people say, you know, we're responsible to God and there, there's a sense in which that's true, but there's another sense in which 
I'm not responsible to God. My surety is. He obligated himself to lay down his life for the sheep. Look at John 6, 37. The Savior said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, who commissioned me, who appointed me to be the surety that of all which he hath given me, I should lose not a one of them but raise them up the last day and present them to the Father. Father, here are all our Benjamins. I promised I'd bring them home. And here they are, washed in my blood, robed in the gorgeous garments of salvation. several years ago, many years ago, really. I grew up in Bassett, Virginia. We had one grocery store in town. That's all we had. And uh, it was called uh, Haynes Grocery. Everybody in Bassett went to that grocery store. And I can remember it. There's a lot of things I for I've forgotten, but I can remember this. He had Robert was his name, Robert Haynes. He's been dead for several years. But he had back of him, he's the cash register right here, and he'd wait on you. He had in back of him, he had a, a string tied to two hooks. It was a long ways across. People would come in and charge their groceries. It wasn't MasterCard, it wasn't Visa. Some people had cash to pay, but a lot of people, and my dad and mom included, they would only pay, they could only pay their bill on payday. Daddy worked at Bassett Furniture Company, and he got paid on Friday, and he'd get his check cashed, and he'd go in sometime Saturday and pay whatever the total grocery bill was for the last week. Now, if, if we had lived in old Scotland, every, every charge of groceries would be called a score. That's what they did back then. They had a, a slate board of some sort and um, if you couldn't pay and you charged it, they'd put the amount that you owed on, on a, a slate board, and that'd be your score. So all those tickets, like when mom or dad go in and charge something, there's the bird ticket, there's the bees, go all the way to the end of the bees, there we are, birds. And every time go in, make, I think daddy got paid every other week. And every time they charged groceries, it was a dip, you know, put another ticket on top of a ticket. And then Daddy would get paid and he'd go in and he'd say to Mr. Haynes, I'm here to settle up with you. And as I said, if it had been in old Scotland, he'd say, add up all my Scots. And they'd do that. Or add up all my my scores, add up all my scores and tell me what the Scott is. The Scott was the total. <coughs> add up all my scores and tell me what the Scott is. And then Dad would say, uh, how much do you say? $20, let's say. And he'd pay. And then Mr. Haynes would have said, if he lived in Scotland years ago, you're now scot-free. Let me tell you something. All of our sins are scores against God. And all of them were added up. 
and our Savior paid the grand total of the scot. And you and I are scot-free. We don't owe anything to the justice of God. The justice of God, you see, has never, ever looked to us for the payment of the debt. Never has been our responsibility. It's the responsibility of our surety. He took care of everything. And we enjoy this great salvation through Him. See, our scores were imputed to Christ and He paid the full amount and we're scot-free. God doesn't look to us for anything. You say, well, isn't it required of us to, to live as the people of God? Well, sure. But not for salvation. That's been taken care of. By our surety. And someday he will appear before God with all of us. What a white robed group it's going to be. <laughs> and he'll say to the Father, Father, here they are, I and the brethren which thou hast given me. Aren't you glad salvation is not in any way at all dependent upon you? Amen. It's fully dependent upon the Savior. Whoever abides with us. We're going to sing for our last song, number 75, Abide with me, abide with me. <clears throat> number 75, I know this is one of Joe's favorites. One of my favorites too, and it's a good good song to end with. Number 75. Let's stand and we'll sing all the stanzas. <clears throat> uh.